All right, on to the next speaker. Uh, this time we will be introducing Lieutenant Colonel Peter Garrison. Uh, we switched his time slot with Mr. Rick Tumlinson, who's going to speak next. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Garrison is a former member of the NSS Board of Directors who came into contact with space at, with the space advocacy community while serving as the Chief of Future Technology Branch for the headquarters of the Air Force. Uh, he will be speaking on why space is important in national security, uh, now and in the future. Lieutenant Colonel Garrison. So I, I want to begin with a, with a few points that I want to make. And the first is that what's our relationship? I work for you. I take an oath to the Constitution, not to the service, not to the president, but to the Constitution. And I, as a member of your military service, do what you as the American people choose to make your command. And what you choose to do in terms of our organization of space, I think will have vast consequences in the future. And I want to make sure that you are the best educated possible as an electorate. And so within that, I am a, a space educator and an educator of uh, space strategists, as you uh, working with Dr. Zarnik at the Air Command and Staff College. And I've had the benefit of having to think about space for a long time. And in fact, I'm the benefactor of Ambassador Cooper, who uh, came with another gentleman, Klaus Heiss, to be one of the speakers uh, at, my, uh, at a strategy session that I had running at the Pentagon well over a decade, almost a decade and a half ago. So I've had a long time to think about space and what is the ultimate expression of space power and why, why you should care. And I'm going to try to let you walk away. It's going to be a bit of a whirlwind tour, but you're going to walk away in a very empowered position. You're going to walk away understanding a lot of things that probably most of your fellow citizens don't understand, the state of play in a lot of things. And I'm going to remove the complexity from you. Instead of giving you some paralyzing difficult, I think the answers are actually exceptionally simple. And you're in a position as a voter to move out on those things. So with that... I want to start with some slides. So I want to go over these things, right? How is space integral to our economy and national security right now? How is that evolving in the future? What are some of the vulnerabilities from the environment and other actors? And then how, uh, how are we anticipating this to move into this multi-trillion dollar economy? And what does that mean for a US-led order? Why do we and why do you care about a U.S.-led world order because we benefit tremendously by the ability to set the rules, set the rules to our benefit, and not in a selfish way, but because liberty is a wonderful way to conduct business. And we extend that, right, because we believe in the power of collaboration over the power of coercion. And if we want to have that kind of an order in the future, it's necessary that we lead. So one of the other things I did want to start off with was what I think is among the, an amazing quote. Uh, have any of you guys read the book, The Little Prince, about the person who lives on an asteroid? Anybody? Yeah. So the author said this, and I think it is among the most beautiful quotes, and hopefully I will be able to bring this home. He says, if you wish to build a ship, do not divide men into teams and send them out in the forest to cut wood. Instead, Teach them to long for the vast and endless sea. And I hope to teach you to long for the vast and endless expanse that is space. So, are we able to dim the lights a little bit? Because I think a lot of my slides are going to be a bit dark. Um, and it's not important that you see me. This is space from, from about uh, uh, 300, 400 kilometers up. You can see that tiny sliver. That's the atmosphere, right? And I'm sure you hear from many people about, you know, spaceship Earth and the fragility, and I think it is amazing to be able to see and see the scale of human civilization and how we're transforming things. But this is the realm of low Earth orbit. So, oh, my slides got squeezed a little bit. <laughs> so it's important to sort of understand a little bit about space to begin with. And what I would say you want to understand is that it's, it's really not like air. Like, it's nothing. I'm a pilot. That's not, that's not how space works. But all of you have thrown a baseball. 
right? So if you look up here, there's a cannon. It shoots the cannonball, and if it's not going very fast, it like falls down. You shoot that cannonball a little bit further, it falls a little bit further away. But an amazing thing is if you shoot that cannonball above the atmosphere and you shoot it hard enough, it actually goes all the way back around to where it started. And it keeps doing that forever. And that's how orbits work. So, if you think about like where space is, it starts about 100 kilometers straight up and keeps going forever, and up stops meaning anything. And this is one of the reasons why thinking about space is so distinct from somebody like me in a blue uniform that thinks about air. So if you look here, what I've got is on the far right, if, you're, if, if it's not too small for you, you can see how close to the Earth the International Space Station and the Hubble Telescope actually are. And that little red arc that I've got up there, that's how high an ICBM travels on its way from, say, Russia to the United States. So this is what I want you to understand about what are the important orbits that people care about today. The Earth is rolling around. And the first one that's important are these sun synchronous or polar orbits. They're coming over the top, and inside the Earth is rotating underneath it. So it's like a raster scan. One satellite can eventually see every point on the entire planet. So if I'm going to put up a spy satellite, I want to put it there. If I want to put up an Earth-sensing satellite, that's a great place to minimize the resources. So that's a very important orbit. And then way out at the far end is geostationary orbit. It just so happens that the speed to run that racetrack is the exact same speed that the Earth turns around. So if I put a satellite there, it looks like it's staying straight over the equator forever. And that's great because I only need like three satellites to get communication over the whole Earth. So that's terrific from a resource perspective and is very important for communication. And in between, there are some clever other orbits, one of which is halfway in between. And that allows us to, that's where we put our position, navigation, and timing so that we can time our signals and figure out on our phone where we are. Now, space is so unbelievably integral to our economy. It is a critical national infrastructure today. It is absolutely critical to your lives today. The first part here is from satellite communications. All kinds of business-to-business -business communications is happening, and satellite communications is about to explode in an unbelievable way. So till now, the majority of satellite communications, and particularly in value, has been out in the geostationary belt. But now we have people wanting to grow the number of small satellites in low Earth orbit by extreme numbers. And I'll talk a little bit more, but that will mean global ubiquitous broadband internet everywhere on planet Earth. I also point out that compared to aviation, it's already a larger market. So then we have all kinds of Earth observation, reconnaissance, uh, that we're able to look and see everything from weather, knowing that a hurricane is coming, knowing that weather is coming, being able to prepare for a snowstorm, now being able to count parking, uh, cars in a parking lot or know where things are. And a tremendous opportunity, whether it's radar, whether it's looking at uh, radio signals, it's absolutely amazing how we are running efficiently our economy. And then, of course, we've got satellite navigation, GPS. All of you have phones, you've got ways that can take you around. Imagine what it would be like to have to go back suddenly to maps if that was not available. But way more than that is the timing, the timing that knits together our electrical grid, timing signal and navigation signals that are critical to the efficiency of our economy. And whether or not you are concerned about it or not, as an efficiency, there is no greener technology than the GPS system. It makes all of our transportation in every domain about 15% more efficient. So consider the impact of that on fuel and emissions. All right, this is kind of an overview of who's got what satellites and of what kind. You can get a sense of this that the, the majority of satellites today, or the largest number, is uh, uh, communications, and then Earth observation behind that. And you can say that we, the United States, are blue, so at the moment we have the preponderance 
So till now, we've really thought about this as, you know, we're people in glass houses, we don't want to throw stones. But it's amazing how fast others are coming into this realm and how important it is for us to structure it. So if you here, I want to talk a little bit about what's the reality. You know, I, even when I talk to most military officers, they have no idea if there are like three satellites or a gazillion up there. So there are about 2,000 total satellites, and the United States pretty much has almost half of them. So you can see up there, just shy of 2,000, probably as of today, there are 2,000. And then most of them are close in, in low Earth orbit. And then the next highest number is out there in geo with a few smattering. And if you look at the United States, over 849, you've got most of them are commercial. And then you have lesser amounts of military and government. All right. But there are threats. Uh, and I don't want you to be paralyzed by these threats because there are threats in every domain, on land, on the sea. Nobody's worried about the fact that we have navies. We're still able to conduct vast commerce despite the fact that we have a navy on the ocean that protects commerce. But we do have, we have a number of different threats that other actors are trying to hold our critical infrastructure at risk. Now, I think the chief concern about that risk is less the all-out war, which we have to be prepared for, but it's the coercive power of us not being able to respond directly in kind or to be able to be in that position to counter coercion and to counter coercion to protect commerce. All right, let's see. I thought I had this figured out, but now... Okay, so everything, you've got direct descent assets, which are just missiles that go up and attack and blow up the satellite, and then you've got lasers from the ground that try to shoot at the cameras or try to overload the solar cells. Then you've got jamming, where the, the uplink and downlink between the radios is something that you try to overwhelm so that the satellite can't communicate, which is also very easy for adversaries to do. And then, of course, you've got the exciting stuff, right? What are the, what are the other guys doing on orbit? Where it's satellite versus satellite. And there are all kinds of interesting things that our competitors are trying to do to make the game difficult for us. So they've got things that run into our satellites. They've got things that come up close and jam. They've got programs to try to develop uh, directed energy weapons, whether it is lasers or high-powered microwaves. You can imagine that they might spray chemicals on your lens or that they'll put a robot arm out there. And we haven't previously designed our systems to be ready for these kind of threats, so that, that just requires that we get on. It's actually not that difficult, we just have to make sure that we're focused on that. So I wanna talk a little bit more about geography that's important because you've heard other speakers talk about it. So unfortunately, it's still hard to see, but I've got two red lines right around the Earth, and I've got that same ICBM line coming over the poles. And that's just to give you a sense of scale. And then immediately outside of low Earth orbit, which sort of goes from about 100 kilometers to 2,000 kilometers, is the, uh, is the first of the Van Allen radiation belts, where the magnetic field of our planet traps these super fast particles that can really damage satellites. And so two things can happen that could have really serious consequences for our nation. One is this little guy up here on the top left, the sun. It sometimes discharges an immense amount of, uh, uh, of solar wind that can interact with that and can interact with our ionosphere and cause us EMP-like problems on planet Earth. And so it would be good if we had a surveillance system and if we were prepared for something like that because that certainly could be existential. It can also put things into these belts that can degrade uh, satellites as well as uh, cause threats to human beings, and we need to know about that. And of course, an opponent can put a nuclear weapon, as you uh, heard Dr. Pry talk about, where they can go much lower than that ICBM uh, uh, arc there, and can introduce a forcing function that then creates a, a, a possibility to degrade all the satellites underneath that over a couple months negating billions of dollars of investment. So that's something to consider. And then we don't like to put satellites inside either of those donuts. If we can help it, we like to be outside of them. And then the last sort of existential class threat 
that we have to be aware of is that there are these things out there on the right, asteroids. Very real threat from very small ones that are like uh, a few meters that look like they're a hypersonic vehicle or look like they're a nuclear weapon coming through and we get, we have no real advance warning right now, we should, but we don't have that. And then you've got larger ones that if they're a little larger than 15 meters, they can come down low enough to do what happened in Chelyabinsk this year and uh, injured about 1,500 people from uh, flying glass. And of course, if they get any bigger than that, they're going to kill a city. And if they get sort of around 100, 150 meters, you're talking something that's getting close to a continent killer. And then if you go beyond that, uh, of course, uh, we know where most of the really big civilization ending ones are, but this is something that somebody should be in charge of, and nobody's in charge of them today. Hmm. So going forward, what's animated? Well, we're lucky enough to have some billionaires that are leading a much larger social uh, movement for general spacefaring. And if we want that as a society, and I think it's a vision worthy of us to want to be multi-planetary, to want to move industry off Earth, to want to ignite a third industrial revolution that's going to mean lots of jobs and a tremendous economy and wealth and a much better world for our children, that's something we may want to do, to become spacefaring, to move heavy industry off Earth, as Mr. Bezos wants, and you can see we're starting to move, right? This <coughs> ideological commitment, not government driving. SpaceX decided on their own they wanted to have reusability. It shifts the map. I showed you the earlier map around Earth. But now that's there, the moon becomes important. The moon is now, the poles of the moon, is the most important strategic real estate in the universe to the future of American power and the system that we want. It is the leverage point. It is like Pearl Harbor, the Rock of Gibraltar, all wrapped up in one. It is the place where we have vast amounts of water that we can turn into rocket fuel, that we can turn into living, that you can extend a logistics structure to do vastly ambitious things, right next to the peaks of eternal light, where you have nearly constant sunlight for power. And that's the bridge point to a much, much larger potential economy. Trillions of dollars in terms of potential metal and structural materials from which we can do things like that, where we're building vast industrial structures on orbit in space and moving out so we can do truly ambitious things, like build a ring of solar power satellites that could provide 24-hour green energy to planet Earth at scale. Five times the scale of what human beings would need if 10 billion people had this lifestyle with air conditioning and lighting and everything. And that's a dream I think is worthy of America. You've got things that are larger than all economies put together in terms of the amount of mineable resources out there. And you've got so many of these asteroids, this is actually not even accurate. We, we, we know of 20,000 close to Earth that could support many times the population that we have on Earth in space and free-flying habitats. And all those ones in red, as much as they're resources for our business, are also potential threats to our civilization. So we want to go out there. And if you look at it, I mean, that asteroid belt, which is the big green one, has the ultimate possibility of sustaining 150 billion people. So our story as humanity is just beginning. And we're at that point right now to decide that we want to be spacefaring. We can build things that look like that, out of things that look like that, that inside might look like that. We can take and green our solar system. We can garden the galaxy, taking our entire ecosystem with us. But we're not alone, right? This vision is shared by others. The idea that the moon could be important for humanity, for its resources, for the sustainability of human civilization, for energy, is shared as a matter of policy by uh, our competitors over in China. And they have a vision to industrialize the moon to build solar power satellites. Because unlike us, when Ambassador Cooper and uh, General Graham wrote High Frontier, we didn't act upon it. They've decided to act upon it and make it national policy. 
And their plan is to put up the first prototype by 2030. 24 megawatts of collection beaming one megawatt down to planet Earth, completely dwarfing the International Space Station and doing it in geostationary orbit. So that's the scale of the peacetime military offensive that we have to be able to look at. And what I would tell you is that while you have to worry about the war fighting aspect, it's kind of like focusing on the hypnotic brass knuckles while the person reaches around to, to grab what's really valuable. And if you don't want to lose, it, the, the plan here is to win without fighting. And if you don't want to lose, you've got to play against that peacetime military offensive. And you're going to have to have organizations that are focused on being, on seeking primacy on this stage. The last thing I would just say is, it's okay to be skeptical, because we're naturally linear thinkers. But if you look at how things progress, it's a series of S-curves. There's a bit of hype, underperforms, then it's additive, cumulative. We learn upon what we learn and continue to move up an exponential curve. We go up as a logistics curve, one against another, it keeps building. So to imagine that the future is going to look like a continuation of today, I don't think so. And I hope that I have caused you to long for that vast expanse in the sky and the amazing opportunity that it can provide to yourselves, your children, your children, and our responsibility to our posterity that is enshrined in our Constitution.